Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. In today's installment of our Advanced Organic Chemistry course, we're joined by Dr. Gabriele Laudario. Gabriele previously joined us for a Research Spotlight episode, but to reintroduce him, Gabriele did his bachelor's and master's at the University of Pisa, studying packed bed reactors and fluid chemistry. He subsequently joined the research group of Professor Timothy Noel at Eindhoven for his PhD, where he worked on novel applications of photochemistry and electrochemistry in flow. He subsequently worked as a postdoc in the same group briefly before coming to Scripps, where he worked as a postdoctoral researcher in the Baron group. Afterwards, he joined the University of Graz as a university associate, where he's group leader of the electrochemistry team. Today, as we continue our special topics and new technologies module, Gabriele will be giving us an introduction to flow chemistry. And from there, I'll hand it over to you, Gabriele. The floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matthew, for your kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture. This talk will focus on the application of technological tools in chemistry. In particular, we will explore how, when, and why it is convenient to rely on flow reactor technology to develop chemical transformations. This lecture is divided into four sections. Part 1 will focus on fundamental knowledge about flow chemistry. Part 2 will describe in detail which components or devices are essential to set up a continuous flow system. Part 3 will display the advantages in running a chemical reaction in same flow and which behavior we can predict by moving from batch to flow reactors. In Part 4, we will see some examples of applying flow reactor technology in the context of photochemistry and electrochemistry. Finally, we will highlight when it is recommended to adopt this technology. Flow chemistry is defined as the branch of chemistry where the reaction mixture is passing through a hollow material called the flow reactor. In an engineering context, a flow reactor can also be named as plug flow reactor, while in the context of applied chemistry, plug flow reactors are referred as microflow, as most of the reactions are carried out with hollow materials where the internal diameter does not exceed one millimeter. Here, the liquid passing through the hollow material has the peculiar behavior of moving in a non-turbulent way, idealized as small lamellae sliding one over each other. This phenomenon is called laminar flow. On the other hand, when the reactor dimensions exceed the millimeter, these systems are called mesoflow reactor. And in this case, the reaction mixture does not proceed with a laminar regime. Instead, small vortexes are generated, and it is idealized as turbulent flow. When a flow reaction is considered, there are two important parameters that must be redefined, the reaction time and the yield. The reaction time is now defined as the amount of time in which the flow stream enters and exits the reactor. This new concept is defined as the residence time, and it can be calculated as the volume of the reactor divided by how fast the reaction mixture is pumped in the reactor itself, which is called the flow rate. Regarding the yield, in flow chemistry, two new parameters can be introduced, the productivity and the space-time yield. The productivity is the mass of desired product that can be produced in a defined unit of time, while the space-time yield is generally defined as the moles or mass of product that can be produced in a defined unit of time per reactor volume. Now let's take a look at the flow setup. Every flow system can be divided in four main parts, the reagent delivery zone, the mixing zone, the reactor, and the quenching and collection zone. The first part of a common flow setup is where the reaction mixture is fed into the reactor. For liquid phases, syringe pumps and peristaltic pumps are the best devices in a non-pressurized system. If the setup is working under pressure though, HPLC pumps are often used. For gaseous phases, generally electrovalve-based devices such as mass flow controllers are used. Alternatively, gas-tight syringes with syringe pumps can be employed for ambient pressure setups. Once the reagents are fed into the flow setup with multiple streams, the different lines are all converging into a mixer. Usually, mixers are plastic or metallic pieces with different shapes, and they allow the efficient mixing of two or three different stock solutions thanks to the extremely small volume of the mixing chamber. Mixers for four ways are generally cross-shaped, while the three-way mixers can be T, Y, and W-shaped. Next, the reaction mixture enters the rear reactor, which is the core of the entire setup. The reactor can be homemade or commercially available, and it can be made of different materials like metals or inert plastics, depending on the purpose of the flow system. Glassy or plastic chip can be also used in case of specific applications, 
especially when particularly small volumes are involved. When reactors are subjected to high or low temperatures, both plastic and metal tubing can be employed. However, when high temperatures and high pressures conditions are required, the adoption of metallic tubing is recommended for safety reasons. Photochemical reactors are usually made of transparent tubing which can be wrapped around the light source or surrounded by it. The tubing material should be chosen based on the selected wavelength of the light source and the cutoff of the reactor material itself. While thermal and photochemical reactors are relatively easy to make, electrochemical reactors are usually much more complicated to design and manufacture. Most of the time, chemists rely on commercially available design where different electrons can be used. As soon as the reaction mixture exits the reactor, the downstream can be directly analyzed in the flow setup. When the analysis of the outlet stream is carried out with non-destructive techniques, that is denominated as inline analysis. Common inline analytical devices that can be coupled in flow are UV visible spectrophotometers, FTIRs, and benchtop NMRs. On the other hand, when the analytical technique is destructive or concentration sensitive, a small portion of the outlet stream is withdrawn, diluted, and subjected to analysis. This approach is denominated as online analysis, and it is commonly used for detectors like mass spectrometry. Now that all the main parts of a general continuous flow apparatus have been described, the next step would be to define how such a system is running. For chemical applications, there are two main ways to carry out flow reactions. The first one is the so-called single-pass flow mode, with an end-to-end -end design where the feeding system and the collection are separated. With this approach, the mixture is flowing into the reactor in a directional way, and for this setup, syringe pumps and HPLC pumps are the most common feeding devices adopted. This design is mainly used for small-scale reactions and when unstable reagents and products are involved in the process. Moreover, this system is one of the elections when the reaction is carried out to collect analytical data, for example, for kinetic purposes. Conversely, a design where the mixture is in a vessel that acts both as feeding system and collector can also be envisioned. In this way of conducting flow experiments, called recirculation mode, the feeding system of choice is a peristaltic pump, and it finds its best application in the scale-up experiments, where usually starting materials and products are relatively stable. One of the most important aspects of flow chemistry that every practitioner must consider is the solid particles handling. This is one of the hardest challenges of flow chemistry because solid particles can clog the reactor, compromising the outcome of the experiment. Nowadays, there are two main ways to deal with solid reactants in flow setups. The first one is to accumulate all the solids in a tube and segregate them with porous materials like glass wool, creating a reactor where the homogeneous solution is allowed to flow through. These cartridges, called packet bed reactors, are commonly used in the context of heterogeneous catalysis or insoluble bases. They are easy to make and versatile in their installation into a flow system. However, careful solid packing has to be performed in order to generate a system with low overpressure. Furthermore, the nature of the solid particles can change during the experiment, compromising the chemical behavior of the insoluble reactants. Another possibility is to generate a reliable suspension and flow the slurry into the reactor. This effect can be generated directly or with the help of a gas carrier, which guarantees the suspension of the solid particles in the liquid droplets. While this way seems more viable than the packet bed one, this flow system is much more difficult to design and control, especially because high flow rates are required to avoid the position of the particles on the surface of the reactor. Both these approaches are valuable and should be considered when a solid liquid system is used. Choosing between one of these two options mainly depends on the designated reaction. After this general overview of how a flow setup can be built and what are the most relevant technical aspects to take into account, let's explore what are the main advantages of flow chemistry and why flow chemistry is beneficial in certain processes. When a flow reactor is employed, the reaction mixture inside the tube gains some peculiar physical properties. Specifically, the friction of the solution with the tube walls guarantees the enhanced mixing, resulting in improved mass and heat transfer. Furthermore, the small dimensions of the reactor create an environment where the transformation is operationally safer and easier to scale up than the corresponding batch reaction. In the context of photochemistry, the small reactor provides an improved and more homogeneous irradiation of the reaction mixture, 
while from an electrochemical standpoint, the small interelector gap generates a more selective and reproducible system. These features are uniquely expressed when multifacic reactions are employed too. The high interficial area and the high mass transfer guarantee an intimate mixing between two immiscible phases. Hence, the material exchange is much more prominent than a traditional batch steering system. Regarding mass transfer, the high surface to volume ratio of the reaction mixture in a microflow system allows a more efficient mixing compared to the traditional batch reactions. This applies, for example, in a highly viscous system. Here, 1,4-difluorobenzene was nitrated more efficiently and with higher productivity in a flow reactor compared to the reaction carried out in a round bottom flask. Another effect of the high surface to volume ratio of flow reactors is the efficient heat transfer. The heat exchange with external environment is much better in a flow reactor. As a consequence, the reaction mixture is heated or cooled faster. One of the best examples to show this effect is the so-called flash chemistry. Organometallic reactions like halogen to metal exchange are extremely exothermic and fast. They are difficult to control and the heat transfer may affect the selectivity of the process. In the case shown here, the selectivity of lithium borylation of this arene was poor when the reaction was carried out in a round bottom flask at minus 78 Celsius degrees. However, when the reaction was carried out in a flow system, much better yield can be achieved at minus 30 Celsius degrees with exquisite scalability and productivity. This is caused by the higher control of the reaction temperature in the flow reactor. The high interficial area creates a perfect environment where two immiscible phases can be efficiently mixed, generating relevant effects on transformations where reagents segregated on different phases are supposed to interact. One of the best applications of this effect is the oxidation of benzylic compounds employing molecular oxygen. In this case, high temperatures were safely employed to obtain the desired product in high yields. Another important advantage of flow chemistry is the on-demand generation of a stable and highly reactive intermediates since they can be safely quenched in the flow stream. A striking example is the generation of the explosive reagent diazomethane generated in a tube-in-tube -tube system where the gaseous reagent could diffuse to the external concentrical reactor where it was allowed to react with benzoic acid to generate the corresponding methyl ester in high yields without any potential harm for the operator. In the context of multi-step synthesis, one can also picture to use a flow setup to obtain more complex molecules just by creating a continuous system where consecutive reactions are carried out. This approach, called telescoped reactions, has been developed and adopted to synthesize many active pharmaceutical ingredients. Here you can see that the drug tamoxifen was produced by leveraging the arylation of a ketone followed by acidic quench and elimination of the corresponding alcohol. The whole reaction stream delivered the product in high yield in only 30 minutes of reaction time. The small dimensions, direct reaction analysis and operator-free nature of flow microreactor technology are perfect characteristics to create automated platforms that can be coupled with artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms. For example, in this literature report it showed a computer-controlled platform where a 3-3 Claisen rearrangement reaction was self-optimized thanks to inline and MR analysis and feedback loop. Many different platforms have been developed and published in literature in recent years. With the flourishing of machine learning algorithms for chemistry, endless possibilities are in the horizon in the development of powerful flow platforms applied in chemistry. Continuous flow technology finds another impactful application when it's combined with photochemistry and electrochemistry. In the context of photochemical reactions, continuous flow guarantees a more homogeneous irradiation of the reaction mixture, leading to more selective and reproducible transformations. This effect can be explained by the lambert bill law. The shorter path of the tubing allows a more uniform distribution of photons compared with the canonical reaction vessels, where at the center of the reactor the absorption rapidly decreases. A clear example of this effect is depicted in this organocatalyzed 2 plus 2 reaction, where the continuous flow reactor design showed better performance both in terms of selectivity and yield. Another remarkable application of continuous flow photochemistry is when multifacic systems are involved. 
For example, in this CH oxidation reaction, oxygen gas was employed in an efficient way, delivering products in a scalable manner. In the context of electrochemistry, continuous flow systems guarantee an improved transport of the reagents to the electrodes, and the small inter-electrode gap reduces the resistance of the solution and generates a more homogeneous electrical field, leading to higher selectivity, shorter reaction times, and less amount of supporting electrolyte required to deliver an optimal transformation. As an example, this electrochemical azeridination reaction is not efficient in batch reactors, as the excess of amine degrades the desired product with prolonged reaction times. However, when a flow reactor is used, the short electrolysis time allows the isolation of the desired product in good yield. One of the widest applications of flow electrochemistry is the scale-up of complex reactions employing a recirculation design with minimal adjustments to the reaction conditions. In such a system, many electrochemical transformations can be carried out at high scale maintaining similar performances, as demonstrated in this paper where an electrochemical birch-like reduction has been conducted even at a 100 gram scale with similar results compared to the standard batch protocol. One of the ultimate frontier of flow technology is the recent and exciting application of photoelectrochemical flow reactors in the context of organic synthesis. Here, the electrochemical reactors were modified to have a transparent window which allowed the irradiation of the reaction mixture while performing the electrolysis. With this approach, there are new opportunities in the scale-up of photoelectrochemical reactions, which would be extremely challenging to explore otherwise. Based on the previously listed advantages and the compelling examples reported, it appears clear now that only some specific reactions can benefit from the use of flow reactors. Namely, reactions involving hazardous or toxic reagents are safer if carried out in flow, as well as transformations that require high pressure or temperature. As mentioned before, flow chemistry is the perfect environment to carry out multifacetic reactions. And finally, it has been demonstrated that merging photochemistry and electrochemistry with continuous flow technology provides much more effective processes. It is also clear at this point that there are reactions that do not benefit from flow systems. For example, simple homogeneous chemical transformations that require just high temperature usually do not show any improvement when conducted in flow. And there is no reason why a simple dump and steer batch protocol should be translated in a flow setting if it cannot be improved by that. In conclusion, I hope this presentation could explain the fundamentals behind flow chemistry and what are the most important decisions that will facilitate the translation of a designated process from batch to flow. For example, the selection of the right reagent delivery system, reactor material, or a single pass versus recirculation design, a routinary decision crucial for the success of a flow protocol. As a final remark, I want to stress how important it is to leverage the intrinsic advantages of flow chemistry to justify the adoption of flow reactors in the process that you are exploring. Remember, always fit the reactor into the reaction, and not the other way around. Thank you, Gabriele, for a great talk. Tune in next time as we continue this module, and be sure to check out the rest of the talks in this course as well. See you next time!